The last few days, the government has taken important decisions on reforms. The push comes at a time when global economy is under duress. Both the World Bank and the IMF are trading with caution on global growth recovery, calling it disappointing and expecting an extremely uneven pace of recovery. Is there hope of global recovery on the cards? What does this mean for emerging markets? What does this mean for India? I'm joined by well-known author, risk consultant Satyajit Das. He was also named among the most influential list by the Bloomberg Markets magazine in the world of uh, global finance. Satyajit, many thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Let me begin this conversation by your own assessment of global growth. The risks to global growth, at least the fears have resurfaced. Do you think the, the world is growing fast enough? Well, I think the world growth at, say, 4% is reasonable, provided you didn't have this massive debt overhang. And really, the real issue now is that the growth in inflation levels are not commensurate with the debt overhang. And don't forget that we never really solved the debt problem because the levels of debt actually went up post about 2009. So that's the first problem. And the other more interesting issue is that the growth problems are now fairly generic across the world. The US, I think, would have hoped that with its slightly stronger growth, there would be a sort of a tailwind from growth elsewhere. Europe, obviously, is in a considerable mess. And given that it's run by a mixture of German flexibility, Italian self-discipline, and French humility, the chance of actually getting much done in Europe is never good. Then, of course, if you look at Japan, Abenomics, is starting to run its course. China and the other members of the BRIC have all their problems. So we're now getting quite a pattern of widespread downgrades. The other interesting thing is, and this is a question that financial markets sort of hedge around, is while interest rates were low supporting financial asset prices, they didn't ask the question why mm. the actual policies were in place. Mm. And they were there because growth was low. And now they're fussing about the low growth. Mm. The other interesting thing, which I think is a factor to take into account, mm. is that if you look objectively at the policy tools available to central banks around the world and to governments, they've pretty much been used up. And Mario Draghi has been very pointed over the last month or so in saying repeatedly that the ECB certainly has almost totally exhausted its sort of weaponry in dealing with the problem. And then on top of that, we have a whole series of geopolitical ructions, things that are going on in the Middle East, the problems obviously in Hong Kong, and obviously now the problems in the Baltic Sea, plus we have Ebola. So we're now facing what I think Hamlet might have uh, referred to as a sea of troubles. So all of that <laughs> is painting a rather more subdued picture globally. Sure. Uh, Satyajit, hold that thought. You know, uh, I, I introduced you as author, and I also said that you've been named by the Bloomberg Markets magazine as one of the most influential in the world of finance. And this is what Bloomberg Markets magazine had to say. Um, I'm just going to read that out to you. Said so Satyajit Das' take is he's gloomy about how global monetary stimulus gets withdrawn without a crash and how China balances, balances its economy. He keeps his sense of humor anyway. Uh, let me ask you on both. Well, I think you've got to uh, laugh about it, haven't you? <laughs> I, I, I did. I, I did not have a good laugh. But, but global monetary policy, you know, we're talking a time when global central banks have kept completely divergent views on how, how the world is playing out. You've got, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve shutting out its liquidity. Uh, ECB is trying to infuse liquidity. China infusing money. Bank of Japan is printing money. Uh, how, do, how do you think, you know, all these central banks view the world? And consequently, how do you think Governor Rajan is responding to all of this? Well, the first thing, I think the last time I looked, central bank governors, uh, if they're male, have to get into their trousers one leg at a time, like you and me. So they're not supermen. They don't <laughs> jump into a phone book and emerge with these superpowers. Mm. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that if you actually look objectively mm. at the problem, what they've done is by lowering interest rates, they hoped to basically allow fiscal positions to be more sustainable, debt to be more sustainable, in the hope of growth and inflation gradually correcting the problem. The problem is the policies that they have haven't actually achieved their objective, but most importantly, what they've allowed doing is the debt to increase. So now you have higher debt than ever before. So if they withdraw the stimulus and basically push up interest rates, well, the problems will not actually go away. They'll get worse. 
And the interesting thing about the divergent views that you mentioned, that's absolutely true. And one of the reasons that the U.S. taper has had almost no effect is twofold. The first thing is what most people misunderstood about the taper was what it was really doing mm. was financing the U.S. government's budget deficit. Mm. And that budget deficit has come down quite markedly, so they don't need that. Mm. And as you correctly point out, it's actually been offset by increased monetary accommodation from the ECB, which in my view will increase dramatically mm. over the coming year, and also continued stimulus from places like Japan and China. Mm. So overall, the liquidity has been very buoyant. We now roughly need probably about a trillion dollars of additional liquidity a, a year, give or take a couple of hundred million, just to keep this Ponzi game going for a bit longer. So basically, I don't think this is sustainable because we haven't made the structural changes that are necessary. And certainly in the case of China, the best way to describe China is, you know, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday are easing days because if we don't, growth will actually falter. And Thursday and Friday are days when we panic that there's too much liquidity and problems in the financial system. Mm. So we'll try to throttle it back and talk about reform. And then Monday comes around again. <laughs> so basically, we aren't making the structural changes. Mm. And we've bought some time with the monetary policy. Mm. But unfortunately, I have to say, we don't necessarily see evidence that it's been used well. Sure. Uh, what about India, Satish? You know, we've seen the last time we spoke was when uh, Governor Rajan assumed office one year ago. Uh, we've had a new government since then politically stable government, you know, bolstered by another political win in, in, one, in, in two states. Uh, the measures that they've taken so far, do you believe that they're, 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 they fix the structural weakness that India faces? Look, the structural weaknesses that India faces will take probably 50 years to right, fix. So right. I don't think you can do that. I think I take some heart in basically the fact that they have tackled the diesel subsidies. Mm -hmm. They didn't do as much as I probably would have felt would be appropriate. But to some extent, that was, you know, scoring a goal when there's no goalkeeper because the fall in oil prices made it a very easy decision for them. And as you can see with the coal decision earlier today, there is a bit of sort of hesitancy about the reform. So, but let's be positive. There have been two great steps, at least in the right direction. And I think in India... The mood has changed, which I think is psychologically and also economically important, in the sense that the stasis of the last government, which towards the end literally basically sat in office, closed the door and hid under the table and did nothing, <laughs> that's changed. There is some motion going on. Now, whether basically that's in the right direction or not, time will tell. Mm. But India at the moment has two really get-out-of-jail passes. One is the falling oil price which has helped enormously. Sure. And that's been offset to some extent by the higher dollar. But that's, a, you know, that's just a huge stimulus. Mm. The other thing is whether we like to believe that the new government will be a reforming government or not, the foreign investors certainly believe that. And the foreign investment flows have basically kept things very, very bubbly and buoyant. So in the short run, I think that will continue. But the thing that worries me is new governments have a very brief period of the ability to get through massive, particularly breakthrough changes. Mm. I'm not sure that that honeymoon will be perhaps as long as the government is waiting. I get the feeling the government is waiting for to win some more state elections, mm. waiting to get uh, control of the upper house. And perhaps by the time they've waited, time will have run out. Mm. Interesting. So, this is, you know, you, you alluded to capital flows. We've, we've seen about $14 billion come into equity markets so far this year, uh, albeit the, the last month, a large part of it has been net inflows. Do you see these levels of capital flows sustaining for the rest of the year, uh, given the fact that India seems to be one of those in, in a sweet spot where you're actually seeing political stability and economic, you know, inf inflation being stable uh, and growth prospects seeing better? I think... I think fundamentally there is a little bit of positive news and a growth of 4% or 5% doesn't look too bad mm. compared to the growth rates elsewhere. So that's going to continue, hope sure. So I, 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 are you, would you say that the capital flows are likely to continue or do you think that you, you're, you're likely to see a surge of capital flows into, into, into the markets? I think it'll be very volatile, but at the moment, the signs are, because interest rates aren't going up anywhere, and the returns elsewhere are very volatile and low. Mm. So I think you will continue to see positive capital flows, but they'll be choppy. Sure. I have one final question. Uh, 
I remember this, this is the last conversation that we had. A large part of our conversation was about the currency, the problem surrounding the Indian rupee, the problem surrounding the current account deficit. Those seems to have been behind us. Do you believe that the rupee is in a, in a lot more predictable, stable range? Well, given that it came from 40 to 60, it's devalued by about 50 percent. So some stability is justified. I think the oil price is important. Some of the gold import issues may come back. I don't know. But certainly the, the fact that the current account deficit is financeable because of these foreign flows is positive. Mm. And generally speaking, the currencies are going to be driven more by what happens to the U.S. dollar mm. in terms of its direction than anything else.